Uh, when you came in this morning, you may have walked by some books, A Case for Christmas, written by Lee Strobel, who was an atheist that uh, really began to investigate Jesus, this man who claimed to be God. And so he kind of gives some answers there. Uh, so maybe you're exploring the Christian faith. If you're looking for some answers, this may provide some for you. Uh, or maybe you're going to visit with some family over the next couple of days and, and you have somebody in mind that this would be helpful. So feel free to take a copy for yourself or someone else on your way out the door this morning. I just want to equip you to, to know who it is that we're celebrating this Christmas season. Uh, and Shelly and I do love Christmas. We love the Christmas season. Our kids love Christmas. And one of the reasons for that is Shelly and I, it would have been 18 years ago, so December 17th, 1999, we, were, we got engaged. Uh, so Christmas, not only are we celebrating just the Christmas holiday, but we celebrate a time where we were coming together, at least beginning to, to plan and prepare our lives together. And so we were engaged up in Chicago. It was the sen- my senior year in college, and Shelly came up to visit my family in the Chicago area. And so we went downtown. Shelly loves uh, the ballet. So I have two older sisters, and so I was asking one, hey, I need some help. Shelly loves the ballet. You know, can you give me some tickets to the Nutcracker? So she helps me with this. This is what older sisters are for, right? Uh, you need tickets to the ballet. They're a good resource. Uh, so she was helping me with that. So Shelly and I, we went down to uh, the city, downtown. We, we lived in the suburbs, and uh, we actually went out to the planetarium. Beautiful uh, city skyline from there. It was a snowy day, not unlike today. It was very cold. And so I went and was going to propose at the planetarium, and then we were going to go to the Nutcracker. So we go to the planetarium. Nobody's there, which is great. It's perfect, right? Except one other couple. Uh, well, who, you know, whatever. And so I'm talking with Shelly. I give her a Christmas card, and, and in there there's a poem, a ballerina bride. So I start going through this poem. I left the last stanza out because it ends with, will you marry me? Um, so I'm going through this poem, and here's Shelly. So she's facing me, and I see this other couple, and the, and the gentleman's walking toward me. And I'm in the middle of this poem, and I'm thinking, oh, man, this is going to be train wrecked. And sure enough, he comes in. I'm about to get into the last stanza, and he says could you take our picture? <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's go take a picture. Hold that thought, Shelly. I'll be right back. <laughs> totally left her there. So anyway, so I went and took this, this couple's picture, came back, and finally got to the last stanza, asked Shelly, will you marry me? And of course she said yes. So um, anyways, that's, that's a bit of our engagement story. Uh, it only takes one couple to wreck an engagement, just so you know that. Um, no, it was good. It's, it's part of the fun of the memory of that night. But we went to the Nutcracker. Um, now, I did not go, grow up going to these kinds of things, you know? So we go enter into the space. My sister helped buy the tickets. I didn't know where these seats were. Well, she, like, bought, like, the, like the kingly seats, you know, like, up on the side. You ever see people sitting in those kind of seats? You're like, who are those people? That was us for one night. Um, so we go, and we walk up to these seats. I mean, the Auditorium Theater in Chicago, it's, you know, this glass, uh, this, this golden roof, and it's just beautiful. Full orchestra kids that sing as a part of the choir in the Nutcracker, Joffrey Ballet, I mean, it's done right. It's extraordinary. So it was incredible. So we go and and basically then start to make that a bit of our Christmas tradition that we're going to go see the Nutcracker every year. So the next year, we go back to Chicago to have Christmas with my family. We go see the Nutcracker again. Of course, love it, round two. But then year three, uh, we're going to go spend Christmas with Shelley's family in Tennessee. So we said, well, we should find out you know, what the Nutcracker is here. So we were living in Lakeland, Florida. Um, Shelly had just finished college. She had one year left when we got married. Uh, we were both teaching there. And so they did the Nutcracker in Lakeland, Florida. So we bought some tickets. So we walk in. How many know it was nothing like the Joffrey Ballet in Chicago? No orchestra, no kids choir. It was like a mom and pop version of Nutcracker on the stage. And it was inter- It was good. It was good. But how many know the real thing is always better than the imitation? Real thing is always better than the imitation. Uh, and that's really true. And that's true in a lot of things in life. You know, I like the beach. I like fires. Um, not that I blend those two. You could, I guess. But think about now, you know, some people like to put like the ocean on their TV and they'll listen to it. You know, the sound of the waves, it's very soothing. But that doesn't compare to you walking on the beach You feel the sand under your toes, you smell the salty air, you feel the water. Not the same, right? And same thing with fires. You know, even if you have a gas fireplace, it's not the same thing as a crackling, authentic, wood-burning fire. You know, the the imitation never replaces the real thing. And think about your Christmas dinners. Anybody that does Christmas hams, like that's your tradition? Nobody does Christmas hams? Come on, some of you do Christmas hams. All right. So we usually do, not that we did overseas, because we lived in countries where... 
uh, pork was not allowed, although I did smuggle a small ham into Sudan, but I'm not telling anybody that. <laughs> so we like Christmas hams. So uh, what if somebody took that Christmas ham and replaced it with a can of Spam? <laughs> not the same thing. I grew up on Spam sandwiches. I'm all, I'm all for Spam sandwiches, but it's not going to be the same as a Christmas ham. Imitation doesn't compare with the real thing. And what I want to look at this morning as we look and celebrate the coming of Christ, the coming of Jesus, is he was the real thing. When you look at the Old Testament, Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadows of what the Old Testament was pointing to. Uh, The Jesus Storybook Bible that we give away to families when they dedicate their children, I love the tagline. It says, every story whispers his name. And that's true. When we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, every story whispers his name. So what I want to look at today is how Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow, better than the imitation. And I would say that holds true in life, too. If you've not made a decision to really follow Jesus, and let me say there's a bit of a difference between being a believer in who Jesus is to having head knowledge here, to really knowing Jesus here, where you follow him, you have a heart and a hunger to know more of who Jesus is, then you're living a life of imitation, And my hope and prayer for you is that this Christmas season, you start to pursue the real thing. The real thing is always better than the imitation. So I'm going to take a look at the book of Hebrews this morning to help us answer this question, to look at how Jesus uh, replaces the shadows of the Old Testament and how he as the real thing is better than the imitation. So Hebrews chapter 6 is where we're going to be today, and I invite you to go there in your Bible. So if you have your Bible... And I do hope you do. And actually, I said Hebrews chapter 6, but I meant Hebrews chapter 8. That's nice. Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 6. So I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, uh, simply out of reverence for the fact that God gave his word to us. And so we celebrate that. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6 this morning. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, He was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Amen. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. So what we see here is that Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow. He's better than the imitation because he is indestructible. Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow because he is indestructible. So the point of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus Christ, Christ simply means Messiah, the the anointed one, the long-awaited one, our Savior, that he didn't just come to fit into the earthly system of priestly ministry as the best and final priest. So it's not that Jesus came to enter into the Old Testament covenant as the last and final priest. No, Jesus came to fulfill and put an end to that system and to orient all our attention on himself ministering for us in heaven. That's what he came to do. So in the Old Testament, the, old, uh, the people of Israel, they're being held as slaves in Egypt. Now, there's a story behind that as well, but I'm trying to summarize something here just so you can kind of have some background into what we're celebrating as we celebrate Christmas. Moses is told by God, so Moses is a character in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, so he's, he's a man of God, and God says, I want you to go to talk to Pharaoh to free my people from slavery in Egypt. And so lots of plagues happen. Pharaoh eventually lets the people go, and they begin to travel through the wilderness, headed to a land that God is directing them toward. But along the way, what happens is Moses goes up to a place called Mount Sinai, and God gives Moses instructions on how the people of Israel are going to be in relationship with Yahweh, with God. And so part of that includes a priestly system with a tent or a tabernacle and sacrifices. So a tent, priests, and sacrifices. This is how God is going to be in relationship with the people of Israel. And these sacrifices provided a covering for the sin 
for the evil acts of Israel. That's what they were doing. But the Old Testament tabernacle, the tent, the priests, and the sacrifices, they were all shadows. Jesus, the Son of God, coming to earth, he made all the shadows pass away. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. We no longer live with the shadow, we live with the real thing. Now, to illustrate this, I want you to think back to your childhood for a moment. So for some of you, that may not be very long ago. For others of you, that may be decades ago, but that's okay. But I want you to think back to when you're maybe four or five years old. And let's say you're in the market, you're at the grocery store with your dad, and you get separated from him. So now you're going up and down the aisles, you're trying to find your dad, you're starting to get scared, you feel the anxiety of that separation, and about the moment where you're about to cry for this anxiety that you're feeling, you see a shadow at the end of the aisle that looks a lot like your dad. So you start to have some hope. And now that's a, that's a great thing, but now think about, but what if your dad steps out into the aisle with arms open wide, he scoops you up, and then he carries you around to the rest of the grocery store? What's better, the shadow or your dad in person? What's better? This is not a trick question, I promise you. The shadow or the real thing, what's better? The real thing. I'd want to see my dad, not just his shadow. His shadow can't do a whole lot to help me in that moment. And that's what it is when Jesus comes. That's what Christmas is. Christmas is the replacement of the shadows with the real thing. Hebrews 8 verses 1 and 2. It's basically a summary statement. That's what Shelley was reading this morning. The point is that the one priest who goes between us and God and makes us right with God and prays for us to God. These are all the things we find in the New Testament. He's not an ordinary, weak, sinful, dying priest like all of those Old Testament priests. Jesus is the Son of God, strong, sinless, and he is indestructible. And not only that, he's not ministering in an earthly tabernacle. He's not in an earthly tent with all of its limitations of place and size and wearing out and being moth-eaten and being soaked and burned and torn and stolen. That's not where Jesus is ministering. No, verse 2 says that Jesus is ministering for us in a true tent that the Lord set up and not man. This is the real thing in heaven. This heavenly tent is what cast a shadow on Mount Sinai that Moses copied. Another great thing about the reality, which is greater than the shadow, is that our high priest is seated at the right hand of God in majesty in heaven. No Old Testament priest could ever say that. Jesus deals directly with God the Father. He is in a place of honor beside God. He is loved and respected infinitely by God. He is constantly with God in the Godhead. This is not a shadow reality like that of a tent or a temple on earth, but ultimate reality. God and his Son interacting in love and holiness for our eternal safekeeping. Jesus is the indestructible priest and temple. And how else does Jesus the real thing? How else does he replace the shadows? Here's a couple of verses I want to point to and things that we find that Jesus replaces that were shadows. Uh, reading in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Cleanse out. So Paul, an apostle, a disciple um, that comes to faith in Jesus after uh, Jesus has left, He writes here to the Corinthian church, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So what we find here, the last plague that causes Pharaoh to release the Israelites out of Exodus is the plague of death. That there's the angel of death, that uh, Moses has given uh, instructions to the Israelites to say, what you need to do is sacrifice a lamb, put its blood on your doorpost, and when the angel of death sees that, he will pass over your homes. That's why it's called Passover. And so this is the last sacrifice. So this Passover becomes celebrated, but now what Paul is writing about here is Jesus is our Passover lamb, that his blood on the cross causes us to look as sinless before God so that we might have relationship with God. So that's what Jesus does. He replaces the Passover lamb. And then Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. So Jesus came to replace the shadow of circumcision. So circumcision was something that would help the Israelites stand out to the people of the world as someone set apart. But now Jesus says, uh, Paul is writing here that Jesus replaces that. And then Jesus declares in Mark, here's what we find in Mark 7. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? 
Since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled, thus he declared, all food's clean. So part of the relationship with God and the people of Israel is that they had to eat certain things. There was dietary laws. But now Jesus is saying, I've come and I'm replacing that shadow. We don't need these dietary laws anymore. These laws exist today. So like if you go to Israel, you're not going to find bacon there, at least not in most stores, uh, because these laws still exist. If you want to try to find a cheeseburger, they don't mix meat and cheese. So like you've got to go and get your meat, you've got to go and get your cheese and put those two things together on your own. That doesn't happen on its own. But Jesus says, I've come to replace that shadow. And then the last one we find here is in Colossians. Paul writes the church in Colossians. He says in chapter 2, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to who? To Christ, to Jesus. The substance belongs to Jesus. So there was all of these festivals and uh, things at the feast that they would celebrate in the Old Testament. But now what we see is that Jesus comes and replaces that. And I sometimes get that question, why don't we celebrate all of the feasts and festivals in the Old Testament? You can, but what we find here is that we have a replacement in Jesus, that he has come to replace the shadow. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why we celebrate Easter, because every story whispers his name, so we celebrate Jesus. Jesus replaces it. So I encourage you, celebrate Christmas with a focus on Jesus. If you're not in the habit of reading the Christmas story before you open gifts, maybe consider that this year. Go to Luke 2. Read the Christmas story and say, you know what, the focus here is that God gave his son as a gift and so we give gifts as well. Celebrate Jesus this Christmas season because Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow because he is indestructible. And Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow because he is our mediator. Here's what we find in Hebrews 8, 6. The last verse Shelley read. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Jesus is our mediator. His death on the cross purchased the fulfillment of God's promises for us. God brings about our inner transformation by the Spirit of Christ. And God works all his transformation in us through faith in the God that we have and who Jesus we serve. So the new covenant, that which is established in the coming of Jesus, it is purchased by the cross of Christ It is brought about by the Spirit of Christ, and we have access to it by faith in Christ. And then Hebrews chapter 13, here's where it lays out who our mediator is. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. So the words, may he produce in us every good thing that is pleasing to him. It describes what happens when Jesus writes his law on our hearts. In the words, through the power of Jesus Christ, it tells us that Jesus, our mediator, he does this glorious work. So not only does God replace the shadows with reality, but he also takes that reality and he makes it real to his people. He writes it on our hearts. God doesn't just lay his gift of salvation before us, this greatest Christmas gift ever, for us to pick up on our own strength. No, he picks it up and he puts it on our hearts and on our minds and puts a seal on you as a child of God as you say, Jesus, I want to follow you. So if you've not put your faith in Jesus, you can choose to do that today and become the real thing for others. While others pursue presence this Christmas season, as you pursue Jesus, you become the real thing for others. Jesus, the real thing is better than the shadow, because he is our mediator. And lastly, this morning, Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow, because he brings true freedom. Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow, because he brings true freedom. As we celebrate Christmas, it would do us well to understand what it is that we're celebrating. You know, why do we celebrate the coming of Jesus? Why do we celebrate him as the real thing? Hebrews chapter 2 helps us with this. Here's what it says. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Not only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. This is why Jesus came. Because we are human, God became human. Jesus became fully man and remained fully God. 
And I'll admit this is a great mystery in many ways, but it's true. And the reason Jesus became a man was to die. As God, he could not die for us, but as man, he could. And Jesus did not risk death, he embraced it. He embraced it because his aim was to die. Good Friday, the day that we reflect on Jesus going to the cross, is what we celebrate Christmas for. In dying, Jesus broke the power of the devil. Satan's ultimate weapon against us is our own sin, our own evil hearts. And if the death of Jesus takes that away, the chief weapon of the devil is taken out of his hand. So we're free from the fear of death. By his death, Jesus wiped away all of our evil. God has declared us innocent. Satan cannot overturn that decree. And God means for our ultimate safety to have an immediate effect upon our lives. He means for the happy ending to take away the slavery and fear of the now. If we do not need to fear our last and greatest enemy, death, then we don't need to fear anything in this life. We don't. We can be free, free for joy and free for others. Christmas is for freedom, freedom from the fear of death. Jesus took our nature in Bethlehem. He became human. This is what we celebrate, to die a death in Jerusalem on the cross. That's what we celebrate at Easter, that we might live fearless lives in this lifetime and in the next. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then you can live fearlessly. Why? Because if the biggest threat to our joy is gone, the fear of death, then why should we fret over little concerns? How can we say, I don't fear death, but I am afraid of losing my job? That doesn't make sense. If death is no longer a fear, then we're free. Free to take any risk under the sun for Jesus. No more bondage to anxiety. If Jesus has set you free, then you are free indeed. What a wonderful Christmas present from God to us and then from us into the world. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus, live confidently in the freedom that you have in him. Let's not walk about living fearful lives. Jesus came to set us free, so let's live in that freedom today. Jesus, the real thing, is better than the shadow. He is our greatest Christmas gift, our real gift. And as you joyfully follow him in freedom, you become a gift to the world. As we close today, and we're going to close in song, I just want you to consider if the life that you're living is one of imitation and not reality, man, may you live in reality this Christmas season from now and into the future. And the way that happens is you dedicate your life to Jesus. That you don't just have head knowledge of him, you have heart knowledge of him. That you truly have accepted Jesus and you're hungry for more of him. That's a life that is one chasing after the real thing. I'm going to invite you to stand as we close in song. And I encourage you, receive your real gift this Christmas Eve. And become a real gift for others. Enjoy the real thing and live in the joyful freedom that only Jesus can bring. Before we sing this last song today, if you're here in this room and you'd say, you know what, I really haven't been pursuing the real thing. I've been pursuing the imitation. But you're here and you'd say, but I I don't want to live that way. I really want to live a life that is centered on Jesus, one pursuing the real gift. One that has real meaning and real purpose and confidence in the future. With every head bowed in this room this morning, I just would like to ask, if that's you today, and you'd say, I don't want to live a life of imitation, but I want to live a life of freedom. I want to live a life of joy. I want to live a life of real meaning and purpose. Simply raise your hand, and I just want to pray with you before you leave today that you might know who Jesus is. Know him as the greatest Christmas gift ever. Anybody here today that say, that's me. I want to know Jesus in that way today. Over here on the right, anybody else that would say, I want to know Jesus that way. I don't want to live a life of imitation. I want what's real. Well, let me pray. God, I just thank you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, as our real gift. That we don't have to live in the shadows, but we can see with reality what it is that you were going after, that you were going after our hearts, that you desired relationship with us, that we might bring glory to your name. And so, God, I pray for those that are here in this room, if they really don't know you, the real you, I just pray that they'd have a desire for that. May you begin to burn a a hunger and thirst for more of you in their lives. Thank you for the man that raised his hand here this morning. If there are more, I just pray that they would have a heart to respond to you and to know you. And God, we just pray that as we head into the next year, That we wouldn't live a life of imitation, but we'd live a life of reality in your name, joyful and free, 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus for a lifetime, we just would want to give you a Bible and information on where you go from here. Pastor Mark, if you don't mind to come up here to the front. So if you raise your hand or would want to respond, uh, even as we sing, feel free to do that this morning. Just step out from your seat, come talk with Pastor Mark, and we'll have some prayer team members up here as well as we have more people come so that they can answer any questions you might have on what it looks like to follow Jesus, our real gift today.